works. I understand what she means. There are few and few of you in this room that I do not know. My name is Joe Clemens. I'm the one sending out all the emails from the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I'm so glad that you're here. And if you don't know me, please come up and introduce yourself so that I like to know everybody that's here. Um, Tara and I have been friends for several years now, more than several. And the ones of you that were here yesterday, we had a workshop on writing. You've already heard the introduction for Tara, but for those of you who are new, I want to properly introduce her so that you know who you're learning from this morning. But when I was a new director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, I was smart enough to follow her footsteps and several other people's footsteps instead of reinventing the wheel. And then, you know, we've just become good friends, and Tara's been here several times in the past. But this is the first time she's given this workshop here, so I'm, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm excited to be here. But I want to read an introduction for her. She serves as an associate professor of criminal justice at New Mexico State, where she's also the founding director of their teaching academy, which is their version of Center for Teaching and Learning there. And I've been there, I've visited there, and it's quite an amazing thing that she's done. She has a PhD in economics from Oklahoma State. Her bachelor's in, is in philosophy from Southwestern College in Kansas. We have a Southwestern here, that's why I say that, in Kansas. And she also attended the uh, U.S. Naval Academy. She's an award-winning teacher and has been honored at New Mexico State and nationally with 10 awards for teaching or service. She's a prolific scholar. She's an author and presenter. And she's published three books, including Publish and Flourish, which is what the workshop yesterday was on and over 25 book chapters in both faculty development and criminal justice. She's presented faculty development workshops to well over 10,000 participants in more than 120 colleges and universities in 35 states, and she's traveled and presented internationally in several countries. So we just want to welcome her. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joe. We teach what we most want to know. I want to know how to excel at teaching. So I teach about teaching. I've had some hard knocks as a teacher myself. I remember always those worst teaching evaluations. Does anybody here remember their worst teaching? <laughs> my two that stick in my mind was the workload was obscene. And this teacher should be fired. I told myself teaching should not hurt this bad. So I started studying teaching. This was many, many years ago that I got these comments. I started studying teaching and um, I, I left the school I'd been at, which was the school of hard knocks. And I started studying what is known about teaching and I, I hope I became a better teacher. Um, teaching is difficult. Teaching well is a lifetime project. Steps break the difficulty down into little tiny units anybody can do, and that's what we'll be talking about today. The steps are in sets, your content and your students, since those are the two big players in the room when you teach. I will argue that active learning, which holds students accountable daily, is the way to excel as a teacher. I will share several ways for doing both. Arguably, the best of them is gentle cold calling, which I will be practicing today. Gentle cold calling works for students because it inspires preparation like nothing else, much better than quizzes or clickers. And the reason it's better is students are more afraid of being wrong in front of their peers especially if they're answering a question that you posed for homework, you know, something you should know. They're more afraid of being wrong in front of their peers by far than they are afraid of flunking a quiz. So it inspires preparation for students. It works for your workload because there are, is no grading. You can do it in class. And there's high accountability. 
It's gentle because it's not personal. It's random. Uh, I would ordinarily use a deck of cards with one name on each card. I'm going to use a list of names today. But when you use a deck of cards, it's just whoever's card comes up next. Now, of course, if you have a problem in your class, you could manipulate your cards a little bit and have a different name come up than what the card says. But uh, in general, I don't manipulate. I'm just calling on people. There's no talking in the back because people are afraid they'll get called on. So um, there's an element of suspense to class. Um, students have a chance to answer hard questions in pairs, like if you haven't posed the question before, or if it's not easy, or whatever, you can have them answer in pairs and then call on one or the other to answer for the pair. The, not just letting the strongest person answer for the group. You know, not just asking the group who would like to answer, but always, always asking an individual. We'll discuss the mechanics of it later, but I want to model this program with what I call my deck of cards, though today it'll be my list of names. I have a lot of question slides. They look like this. There was no homework, so there's no shame in being wrong, and there's no such thing as being wrong. There's just, um, just different answers. So every time you see a slide like that, you grab a pen and write the answer down because when you're cold on, you're expected to know, um, you're expected to say the answer immediately. And this means everybody's engaged because everybody has to write it down. No one knows who will be called on. You learn more by committing to an answer before hearing one, and it goes a little faster if you've written it and you're ready to talk. So enough of that. Back to teaching your content. There are several steps for content, and we'll start with extending time on task. I had someone after the lecture the other day, after this workshop last Wednesday, say to me, well, I'm not willing to give up content. We're actually asking you not to give up content. We're asking you to extend time on task by having people do more homework so that you don't have to say everything that they're supposed to learn. We're trying to get away from the lecture textbook trap. I lecture because they don't read. They see no reason to read because I'll go over everything in class. That's the lecture textbook trap, and we want to get away from it by having students spend more time on task. So let's ask you a couple of questions here. I believe it's our first question slide. Uh, take a pen and write 12 class hours plus blank study hours equals the total study time in theory. Are we supposed to do these on Monday? No, anywhere. Okay. They're not on those. Those are for something else. So how much are they supposed to study for 12 class hours, and what would that come to as a work week? And in the reality, what do you think students today, according to research study, this is self-report research when students are asked confidentially what, how much they study and what total hours that would lead to? And my first lucky winner is Keith. What did you write for theory and where are you? You'll have to show me where you are because I'm not sure I can read all the cards. Yes, Keith. So I put uh, two, uh, sorry, uh, 24 hours mm -hmm. study hours for a total of 36 class hours. Right, that's full-time study. Now some people say three, I think that's graduate school, where you have nine hours plus three times nine equals around 40. But yes, 12 hours plus 24 hours would equal 36. In reality, how much, Mary Adams, do you think students are reporting studying now, according to Nessie? Yes. I put about 10 total hours. 10 total hours. You are a very good guesser. OK, so. Um, The answer is eight. It's very close to 10. And um, that's the problem right there. 
And we're afraid to break the curve and get students to study more nearly the total amount because we're afraid we'll be penalized on our evaluations. My experience is, and some research shows, we're not penalized for expecting more when we provide the support to reach the goal. We're penalized when we're seen as arbitrary more than when we have high expectations. In fact, there's some research that says higher expectations go with higher uh, valuations. So, all right. So survey your students and ask them how many weeks, how many hours a week they study for your class. When I go to um, st classes across my campus, the answer is usually in the 15 to 30 minutes range not the two hour range. The only place where you get it measured in hours, you know, you ask in minutes, but they, they put 240 minutes is in engineering. It's the only place where answers are high. In the humanities and social science, answers are alarmingly low. So there's room for us to expect more out of class, and that's the trick to being able to cover less in class. Step two, limit lectures to 15 minutes. This is medical students, high ability to concentrate. But their concentration looks like this at the 15 minute mark and this at the 50 minute mark. So because of that, we've got to respond to current students' attention span in fact, this was done in 78, and it hasn't gotten any longer <laughs> since 78. In fact, with my students, both undergrad and grad, I like to limit my lectures to seven minutes because I start to see energy fall after about seven minutes. So the literature says seven to 15 now, and you want to keep in that range for straight lecture. You can break up lecture by doing lots of different things which we'll be talking about today. Here's your heart's reaction to lecture. They were afraid to go past 80 minutes for fear of what it would show. <laughs> My alma mater. Instead we want class to look like this. We want students to be engaged with the material in a lecture, so much is happening in the room, so much critical thinking, so much learning, so on and so forth. Who's doing it? The professor. Thank you. I mean, it, you have the sensation that much is taking place because you're doing it all. All right, so, but you say, I have to cover the material. In my discipline, the material is so exhaustive that I have to cover it. And indeed you do. They have to cover it, not you. They have to cover it. And if you can push some of it out of class, you come out way ahead. In a land before time, in a school not far from this one, there was a pitcher that was trying to teach a glass. The pitcher wanted to share as much content as possible, so it poured in a great rush like a fire hose. What is the moral of the story for learning? Just take a minute and jot down. Talk to a partner if you'd like to. What's the moral of the story for learning? Okay, let's come back together. All right. <laughs>
Dion, what did you write? Uh, we thought about quality, not quantity. Quality, not quantity, all right. Yeah. What other morals? Whoops. Well, and that the students are capable of absorbing so much information, but then they need time to reflect. Ah, reflection time, good. Uh, let's see, who's next? I'll take uh, Monique Sawyer. Right here. Right there. We were just talking about kind of the same idea that learning takes time and that you can't just pour it all in at once. It's just going to yeah, not stick. All right. Here's my moral. Those are all good. <coughs> it's not what's poured from the pitcher, but what lands in the glass. <laughs> and stays in the glass. Yeah. All right. So, doesn't matter how much you share, it matters how much they catch. I once overheard a colleague of mine, who was not a friend, say to a couple of other colleagues, she doesn't even teach. I thought, that's funny, I'm there every day. I wonder what she means by that. So, my questions for you are, what did my colleague mean by this? Just jot down your answers. What assumption was she making about teaching? What assumption was she making about learning? And what would a better assumption be for learning? Just take a minute and jot those down. Talk to a partner and see if you got the same answers. together. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap two times. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with, I believe it's Jimmy Valiente. Yes. So what did you think for the first one? You didn't even talk a lot in class. I didn't even talk a lot in class. Thank you. All right, how about Alyssa Ward? Same one or Second one. For teaching is content. And what about learning? Direction, dialogue directly from the teacher. All right, thank you. How about what's a better uh, way to look at it, Amy? I put three things critical thinking, retention, and application. Critical thinking, retention, and application. Good for you. All right, thanks. Okay, I wrote, and there are more than one interpretation, as you could tell from the audience. Teaching equals telling, so I wasn't doing enough lecturing. Learning equals listening. Very bad assumption, by the way. Let's try learning equals doing. Critical thinking, analysis, application, etc. 
Okay, so would teaching equals telling work here? I'm looking at Bill and Joe. <laughs> Not so much, huh? It doesn't work in our disciplines either. I've talked to you about the theory of why active learning works. Here's the research. The two best studies, both with control groups, one with an N of 6,000, found that active learning versus traditional lecture increases learning by what percent? Please jot down a number. Susan. Where is Susan? There. It's our table. We're, we'll, we'll just kind of keep going. Um, 50%. Whoa. Those are the two best studies. Lots of studies have echoed that. But these are the two best studies. Yes. Now that is done on a standardized, both of them were measured on a standardized physics test. So suppose the average score was a 36 with lecture, the average score would be twice that without lecture. So that's a little different than some of the questions I'm going to ask you where we ask you what grades, how much grades increased. Because if grades are 85, of course the grade didn't double for obvious reasons. Okay, so Freeman, meta, he meta analyzed 225 studies in STEM comparing active learning versus exam grades. So here's an example of the kind of question I was mentioning. It increases exam scores by 3%, 6%, 9%, or 12%. You've got your colors. Please don't raise them until the count of three. But you can start picking out which one you think is the answer. On the count of three, we'll raise them. You put them right here so other people can't follow the good leader. <laughs> you put them private. OK, one, two, three, I'll cross your heart. I see a rainbow of colors, but mostly green. 6%. Increases grades 6%. So if your average was an 85, now you'd have a 91. So if your average is a 70 or a 67, that could really make a difference in your grades. Also, if you use lecturing, it has 1.5 times the number of people flunking than if you use active learning. OK, here's a really tough one. 30 seconds to discuss with your partner. Does active learning help minority and first generation students more or less than other students? And the second question is by what percentage? 30 seconds to talk. All right. So by show of thumbs, was it more or less? I see a whole bunch of mores. I usually get about half and half. And you are right. It is more. So now we get to the percentage. And I'll call on Rick, who's right here. I guessed 120. You guessed 125%. I think this is, let me show you the question, because this is grades. Oh, you. oh, there it is, 100%. So it increases grades much less than that, which is where I was going. It increases grades on this study. It's a different study, 3% for majority students and 6% for minority students. Thanks. So if you really want to help people who really need help, this is a good strategy for first generation and minority students. 
Why is it better? Black students in particular said it helped them for two reasons. They um, spoke more in class and saw the class as more relevant when there was active learning. That's what black students said. All students said there were three changes. They completed the assignments more frequently. They spent more total time studying for class back to extend time on task. And they had an increased sense of community. So what are we actually doing in class? It depends somewhat on who you ask, but the best study just came out. Um, and it says, instructors talk without questioning students what percentage of time? Just jot it down. <laughs> All right, Brienne. Where is Brienne? Oh, your table again. Woohoo! What percentage? This is in general? Yes. I don't know how often they count questioning students. I know no one watching this would say I was doing straight lecture, but I don't know if you ask one question in 20 minutes, if that counts as questioning students, I, I don't know the details, but that's the, that's the latest finding. It's down from 88. My slide said 88 before I came here. And that was a little old, and this study was bigger and better. Oh, is this already published? 2020. Yeah, I don't know. I think I typed wrong. I think it, but it may be it's just coming out. That may be why I haven't read it. I don't know. I just saw this in Inside Higher Ed and said, uh oh, I better update my slides because this is in STEM, and STEM has the reputation for doing more lecturing than other disciplines. So, and I don't know if that's true or not because all the research is in STEM or most of the research is in STEM. So I don't know if that's true, but that's the reputation among scholars. Yes, sir. I wonder if you also talk about R1 institution versus other institutions mm -hmm. where R1 institutions do research, they might lecture because they don't really do teaching too much versus small institutions. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That would be my, um, yeah, that would be my assumption having taught at a liberal arts school, but I'm not sure it's true because I haven't seen research. Was there a hand over here? No, don't even move. I'll call on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm assuming this is for undergraduate. Or is this across the spectrum? This is undergraduate. Okay. And, but I don't know how much better it is with graduate students, but I hope it's some better in the seminar format. Yeah. OK, so. Going back to our medical students, what we want to do is introduce an activity every 7 to 15 minutes. A short activity like a question could re refuel your students for a few minutes, but a longer activity might be appropriate every now and then. By interjecting activities, we lift the, extra, the energy in the room uh, exponentially because people start talking and engaging and realizing they have questions and that's where the rubber meets the road. So step three, oh, not only will students learn more, you will have more fun as we are witnessing today because it's just more interaction activity going on with your students. Step three, flip your classroom. Move content, well, first of all, I'll ask you what does flipping your classroom mean so we all have the same definition because there are many. So um, the question slide says, what is flipping the classroom? And I think it might have another question. What is the content step you are willing to try? No. Nope. What is flipping the classroom? So make a note of what is flipping the classroom and one lucky winner will explain it to us all. Make 
Okay, Julie Harris, right here. right here. What is flipping the classroom? It's my understanding that it's asking the students to do the, what would have been the note-taking pr preparation work at home for homework, and then taking that information in class and working in activities where they have to apply that information to certain scenarios. Thank you, that's what flipping the classroom is. I hope everybody could hear that. Uh, flipping the classrooms, pushing learning lower level stuff out of the class and keeping higher level stuff, critical thinking in the class. That is exactly right. I often hear people say, well, it's using technology. Well, it can be because you might use technology to give your quiz before people come to class. You might use technology to have people post something. So anytime you're having them do something besides listening, you're flipping the classroom, if you push stuff out of class so that activities can happen in class. That's flipping the classroom. So why do we want higher order thinking done in class with peers and with you rather than uh, l listening to lecture? I'll call on Arnika. Arnika. Yes, why, it should appear on a slide and it doesn't. Why do we want critical thinking in class rather than out of class? Uh, because that's our opportunity for them to truly engage and there's a level of accountability. If they have to answer a question or be involved in an activity with other people, they're actually going to do the learning instead of asking them to do it outside of class and hoping it happens. Thank you. So the critical thinking would be like, if you were discussing the Civil War, you could have students learn at home who the leaders were, what they stood for, how they led. You could have them learn which states were on which side, all this basic stuff that they probably need to know before they can discuss the big question, which is why did the war occur? Was it states' rights, like so many people think? Was it slavery, the moral issues? Was it slavery, the um, economic issues? So you, um, you can deal with that big question all hour because you give a quiz at the top of the hour or do whatever you do at home, quiz at home, to have, make sure the rote memory is, is taught by extending time on task and flip the classroom, do the important stuff in class. I think podcasts should be about three to seven minutes long. You can offload some of your lecture to podcasts. The great thing is they can stop and review. They can skip parts that they already know. It frees class time and it extends time on task to do podcasts. I think you need a reason to read or a reason to listen to the podcast for most students now. It's not enough to say read chapter six and come prepared for the most part. You gotta give a little bit more of a target than that. We'll talk about that a little later. You've heard the expression, let your fingers do the walking. Let your readings and short recorded podcasts do some of the talking. So you don't have to go over so much. Write down a question that you're willing to, whoops, I'm ahead of myself. Well, I'm gonna back up. Um, ask me three questions. This is something I use at the end of a section or the end of a um, class period. Like we've got five minutes less. Ask me three questions and we're out of here. You would be amazed how many questions rise in the air because people have questions, they just don't ask them because they don't want to interfere with your lecture. They don't want to slow down and make the class run longer. But if you say, ask me three questions and we're out of here, you'll be amazed how many questions there are. So what questions do you all have? Yes. So it's not really a problem at this university too much. I don't know what their biggest class is. The biggest class I teach here is like 48. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic 
and doing these kind of things in a classroom the larger it grows becomes really like a challenge so what kind of things do you have like specifics that work really well with like giant classes because i mean some universities you get like 320 students. yeah in 320 i would have all the all the activity probably working in groups okay. but in 100 i would still use uh calling on students okay with 100 it still keeps people far more awake than the same seven students in the front asking the same seven questions so you encounter, like in a class of 100 even when you call on someone i find that like they're very shy about talking so is that when like you have them talk in groups first to kind of break yes it if it's a hard question if it's something like guessing a statistic out of the air i don't have them talk oh. at first but if it's something where they might feel really wrong if they got it wrong i might have them talk to each other if it's homework i give study questions every day so if it's homework and it's a study question it's fair game brianne what's the answer you know it's it's not even a question that they'll know it if it and you'd be amazed how well homework is done when you use this approach that was one question yes um, you, you gave us a lot of good information on uh, the active learning studies um, with regard to um, how much better people learn. And you talked about, um, well, it just made me think about were there any studies that looked at how it increased, how active learning increased motivation for learning or efficacy? Like just the I think I can do it? Were there any things related to that? I'm sure there are. I'm, I'm not an expert. Okay. Mostly what happens is learning goes up and it goes up for efficacy too. Yeah, they're tightly tied. Yeah, does anyone else want to speak to that? No. Okay. research, but I just know what's happened in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The more actively they're engaged, the more motivated they are. It's apparent. And it's apparent. Look, they want to come to yeah. class. They, they want to participate more. Yeah. They're more, uh, more yeah, they're more responsive. That's they're, the reason that I, that, I mean, I witnessed mm -hmm, that. That's mm -hmm. the reason I was wondering. If right. There was and I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. I just need to do a Google search to find that. You're going to see similar answers in a lot of these upcoming slides about types of active learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more. You'll do people a favor, yes. Uh, you, you mentioned something about giving study questions. Do you give study questions for them to do for homework? Yes, uh, and then so one of them is the, for their homework. exactly, and one of them is the quiz at the top of the hour. When I walk into class, people are buzzing. Hey, I didn't get number six, did you get number six? It might be the quiz, I think it's gonna be the quiz. And it, there's a lot more energy around it. A lot of people give the quizzes at home, that's fine if you want to give quizzes at home that works too um sorry this is the fourth question and and bob's the fifth because he had his hand up so you you spoke of seven minutes limiting yourself to seven minutes mm -hmm. are you talking about in a one hour class no seven minutes at a shot then there's an activity and another seven You're minutes doing the alternate every seven to 15 minutes but never never longer than never that. longer than 15 yeah at a time but you can get two 15 blocks in an hour if you really need to, if that's what you need to do that day. Well, what would you do if you had a four and a half hour class? I do very few blocks, but I would do several mm -hmm. seven to 15 minute blocks. And if you're interacting like this, you can do a little longer than if you're not interacting a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob. The question goes to either hybrid or all online classes. How much of this is going to be able to apply or has the research been done yet to indicate what we can do as instructors or facilitators for the mm -hmm. online type program? Well, you can do actually online learning by definition, unless you're just playing hour long lectures, is pretty interactive. So it's some of it is built in. What I like to see added to a lot of classes that I look at online is I like to see video added because students get tired of post, 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 and in Canvas, which I hear you all are using too, it's just a button and you have to have a little microphone to get good uh, sound. But if you put in your syllabus that you have to have a microphone on just the standard earbuds, 
uh, you have to have a microphone on that. You will have wonderful one minute talks from the students and we'll talk about how you don't have to grade them all. But you have to have them do lots of them with randomized grading. They don't know if it's going to be graded or not, but they do lots and lots of one minute or one paragraph posts. So yeah, online kind of invites active learning unless you, I've had faculty post their whole lecture on there as, as the learning. I have yes. a question regarding grading. I always say that, uh, um, let's say 15, 20% of your final grade is considered participation in class. Will this type of uh, active learning be rewarded by a higher percentage of their final grade? It could be. It could be. I don't have any part of my grade go to how people respond in class. It's kind of its own reward. But if you had somebody on the borderline and they were always spot on when you called on them, I can't say you wouldn't consider that. So that's what I always say is that your final grade participation, yes, there is that 15%. But then, again, when I'm looking at you as a student and your progress, I will also consider your engagement in class. But when you have, you know, the system of randomly calling students, then that kind of goes unless you go with your answer was always right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That or yeah. Answer. And you get to know your students so well. You learn every name and so on and so forth. Okay. What's one thing you are willing to try? It could be small, but what's one thing you're willing to try in your class? Just write it down. And when you're done writing, talk to your same partner. about something they want to try. Does anybody have a question about it, like problems that might arise or anything? No pressure, but if there are any, yes. So I don't, I don't do the cold questions in my class. I teach music theory, mm -hmm. so a lot of application is built in. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to measure with online quizzes before they get to class. That tends to be my way. Mm -hmm. But I'm intrigued about the cold questions. The one question I have about it is, what do you do about the flip of the student? So. If there is no, if there's no points attached to these questions, the one that uses humor, class clown, to kind of blow off the fact that they're not prepared. Hmm. So if there's not any kind of points attached to it, they can just make something silly and make the class laugh and kind of blow it off. Hmm. I don't want to say what, I have a colleague who says, I've never had that problem. I don't want to say it, but I, I can't picture a student who did that regularly, so I don't honestly know what I would do. Does anybody have a way they would handle a class clown? I, I think I could say yes, but that's not the question or something like that. Uh, perhaps you could try um, in advance, letting them know, giving them some responsibility or something in advance, letting them know you're going to call on them um, so that they feel in this place of honor, so to speak. It gives them some responsible uh, productive 
means of contributing to the class as opposed to this alternate means that gets them something. I, I don't know what it is. But um, making use of some skill that they have and letting them know in advance so they can prepare and know, okay, it's my time, that sort of thing. Yes. I've definitely had a phase that it's like, I didn't do the work, sorry. So I totally know that this exists. But I find that the, the peer pressure of the class, like my buy-in is so great with the conscience of the class that most of the kids want the same. They, will, they respond to that buy-in. And so at, at Venture, the peer pressure kind of puts those people to want to do it. And I've only had one really terrible student who was just outright rude. And I just told him, you're wasting your time and mine. You must leave my class. And he left. Wow, good. So, but that's, that's like a super extreme move <laughs> that I wouldn't do like the first time, but it was like a repeated, like, I don't value this. Mm -hmm. One thing I hear people say is, I, I worked in groups and one group didn't work, and so I'm going to quit active learning. And I'm like, well, when you're lecturing, there's certainly one group that's not listening, that's on their phones, you know? So even if one student blows you off, if you if you have 25 with you, you've got to consider that in your uh, calculus. I've worked with some faculty with similar problems, and I've had or they have had um, good luck with speaking individually, mm -hmm. privately, because as Dion said, they're after they're acting that way for a reason. They're after some kind of attention, and just to pull them aside, maybe ask them to stay after class. Mm -hmm. and say this is inappropriate and I mean just treat them as an individual good take it very seriously mm hmm yeah it would be very serious okay so um, here are four ways oh I did have more but we've done it um, Step five is ask before you tell. It's under your students, and it's a way of holding students accountable daily so they cannot get into the lecture textbook trap. Ask before you tell is what we're doing today. It's like uh, it slows you down, but that can be good because people retain more of what they do here when they're slowed down. So you ask a you, at, you make every statement or many statements into questions, and you find out what people are knowing if it was from the reading, or um, guessing, or reasoning out if it's not from the reading. Focuses attention on the subject and raises interest. It helps students learn. Step six, gentle cold calling. I will tell you a story about my teaching economics. It's not particularly flattering to me. I was teaching microeconomic theory in my first job. I'm trained as an economist of economics of the criminal justice system. And I was teaching microeconomic theory not very well, I might add. It was not going well. And I was doing what many teachers do, which is a wonderful game called Blame the Students. You know, these people are not like me. They do not study. They do not this. They do not that. So I was, I realized the guy next door was teaching international economics and to the same student body and he was winning awards for his teaching. So I thought, hmm, maybe I could go to his class and see how he's winning these awards and apply that to my class. So I went to his class and he had a deck of cards. He was calling before he was teaching international economics, which is highly mathematical. And every time he put a line of a long equation on the board, he would call on someone, no, so what do I write next? So what do I write next? And everybody wrote it down. They wrote their estimated next line of the equation down and he, one lucky winner got to tell the whole class what they were gonna say. And I talked to him after class, and I explained that that was great for a middle-aged man, but for me, as a 26-year-old woman, they were going to say I was top-down. They were going to say I was uh, autocratic. They were going to really be critical. So he said, well, why don't you try it for two weeks? 
So I, I went in there with my deck of cards and said, new policy, you know, be, sh be ready tomorrow. You, those study questions you have, you'll be called on them with no prior warning. I didn't even have them right first because the answers sometimes were long. I just called, Bill, help me with number one. And um, I went in there and gosh, they hated it for two weeks. Then they wrote on my evaluations, I've never been so attentive, I've never studied so hard, I've never learned so much, and on and on. And that was starting at midterm, which I don't recommend. I recommend starting it on the first day with syllabus questions, saying, you know, read your syllabus, read it carefully, then I'm going to ask you some questions about it. And we'll show you that this is not scary, this is just requires a lot of advanced preparation. That's all. So ask before you tell, gentle cold, use gentle cold calling, and look at page three. The number is up there in the red. Look at page three and um, read the mechanics, and then I'll field questions on the mechanics. Okay, what questions do you have about the mechanics? You've seen it done, so you may not have many, but if you have some, yes. The 3B, <coughs> just provides your main major headshot, kind of want to be remembered. It goes on like a, a placard or something? Yeah, the front of the card, I didn't use those slides today, maybe I should have. The front of the card has their first and last name in big letters with their picture. And the back has how they want to be remembered. So you read through, like one kid had a pet pig. If that's how you want to be remembered, fine by me. I, it certainly stuck in my head. I can still tell you who it was now. <laughs> but um, it, it helps to have. How, to be, how you want to be remembered. Well, any, you could use any prompt you want to use. But like I, I ask my students how they want me to make an association between their name and face and who they really are. Other questions, any? No pressure? We'll move on, yes. I'll follow up then, do you have the students keep the card or you collect them at the end? Oh, I, I have them make them on the first day at home because they have to attach a picture, bring them the second day, and I keep them because I'm using them to call on people. Then you can switch to popsicle sticks, which is more random than, you know, they see you shuffle and they're like, oh, I've got to, I might go again. So cards are not as perfect as popsicle sticks, but they help me learn names. I don't understand what popsicle sticks Oh, you just put a name on a popsicle stick and you put it in a cup. And then when you draw, you could draw the same person two times in a row. So it's completely random. Thank you for asking because I didn't explain popsicle sticks. Yes? I'm confused on number 5A, and when you have big classes, calling on two or three students. You're trying to stretch your questions and get more people to use their voices. So instead of saying, uh, you, instead of Joe saying 6% and me saying, well, it's really 8, you say, Joe, what do you think? Bob, what do you think? Bill, what do you think? And then you reveal the answer. Just to get more people called on in a big class, you stretch your questions in a sense. Yes. Whoops. You want to ask another one? Yes. Oh, why do I call on individuals rather than the group? Suppose you're six groups and I call on team two. Who pays attention during the uh, during that teamwork? 
a couple of people. The person who writes it down, the person who leads it. The other people may not be prepared to answer, but if I call on Kevin, is that Kevin? Yeah. If I call on Kevin, then he's got to listen while you all are doing it. He may not be taking the main notes, but he, and he may not be the leader of the group, but he's got to listen because he's accountable. Thank you for asking. I, I could spell that out better. Oh, yes. Can I suggest another way to do that if you don't want, if you don't want to have to try and figure out the names of the group or whatever it is? You, just, you know, when you have the one person answer for the group, then you check in. And what do you think? Do you agree with this? Do you have anything to add? Just like you would extend um, the other. Uh huh. Yes. Good. Okay. That was gentle cold calling. With the cold calling, there's also an app you can have where you just enter your student's name and so your phone can randomly. Yes. Your phone can randomly do it and that might be easier to haul around than a deck of cards. Yeah. All right. All right. Couple of questions about cold calling. Yes. Does anyone know? I think it's called random. Random? I have it on my phone. Randomly. Thank you. I have one called Pretty Random. <laughs> it's pretty random. It's pretty random. It's pretty. What's your Google? Okay, two questions. Students in in uh, classes with cold calling call by. <laughs> Excuse me, study more by what percent? Please write your answer down. Ross Oaks, Miller. I will say just out of my own experience in those kind of classes, I, mean, I, want to, I would say close to, I'll go maybe 75%. 75% more. All right. How about Katie Jacobson? I'm going to say 50% more. You're going to say 50% more. Study more. <laughs> like the amount of hours per week. How about Ar Arnica? Yeah. Arnica? Um, well, if you said they studied 15 minutes before and we're asking them for probably at least an hour of work, that's what, yeah, four times, 400. Whoa. You're the winner. Oh my God. Now, I just did something that I don't really recommend, which is I called on multiple people trying to get closer to the answer. I don't really recommend that. I recommend that it's fairly random when you call on more people. So you do it depending on the question, how hard it is or something like that. So it's not always clear that the first people were further off. So I try to do it random, but we had just talked about using a question multiple times, so I did it. Yes. Can you tell us more about that study? When, where, uh... <laughs> Let me look at my notes here. Um, students complete what I've t what I've written from reading it is students complete almost twice as much of the reading, which is three three quarters the total reading, but they they report just before and after increasing their reading four times. I can give you the study if you'd like to read it. It's 1996. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. With cold call calling, hold your thumbs for a minute. Did you, did you learn less today or more based on cold calling? Thumbs are up or down? A lot of up. There may be some down, same. I get, I see a same. So for most of you, you learn more. All right, next step. Quiz daily without grading all the quizzes. Quizzes can be short when they're daily, like one question, one short answer, or three multiple choice. And it ups learning a lot. We'll discuss how much a little later. Um, you may say, well, I can't grade a quiz every day. Well, that's true for most of us. So consider rolling a dice and setting odds appropriate to the day. And I say appropriate to the day because um, 
there are many factors that factor into whether I grade a quiz or whether I set high or low odds. I don't necessarily control whether I grade it, but I might say if it's a one, I'll grade it. If it's two through six, I won't. I roll the die, it's a two, I don't grade it. So the odds are long, but they don't know the odds until they've finished the quiz, turned it in, and discussed it. So their attention is on you while they turn it in and discuss it. Let me ask you the mechanics here. You're say, what you're saying is you give them a quiz, mm -hmm. and, and, and they all take the quiz, and then you roll a dice in front of them as to whether or not that quiz will be graded. Correct. Okay. That is exactly right, yes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. which makes quizzes, pop quizzes, essay uh, challenge, and that's something that I've had to deal with doing a lot of gen ed courses. Um, so one approach that I've had to make the quizzes um, meaningful without having them, uh, I don't know, trying to make the material work better for them, is having them do quizzes through Canvas beforehand where they have multiple attempts, <coughs> letting them know from the beginning that these questions are going to be on your exam. Mm -hmm. So make sure you are paying attention Exactly. Um, so that way they're not, uh, the learning disability students don't have the same like anxiety or I don't have to make special exceptions at the beginning of class so they can go. Yes. It, do, it certainly doesn't have to be done in class. Bill was saying by doing it in advance, you have the advantage of looking them over before you get there. So if everybody got it right, you're not standing up there saying, let me pontificate on this question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can certainly do it in advance and that gives more time to people with learning disabilities. Yes? Just to add in that, something that um, some of us have done successfully on Canvas, uh, it'll allow you to, to put a huge pool of questions in. Mm -hmm. And then so if you're worried, for instance, about students getting together and completing their quizzes together, <coughs> uh, you can give every student a randomly selected subsample and you can even have them retake and retake. And if you had 10 study questions, you could pitch a different one of your 10 to each person, even if they're short answers. So that's very good. So eyes wide open. Students are taking your pool of questions. They are working together, and they're creating quizlets on your pool of questions so that the next group, the next semester, can just look up your chapter, your course, and get to your questions. Just eyes wide open, folks. <laughs> It's depressing, but it's true. I like in class to roll the dice, even if I've done it at home, because it shows it's, um, it's transparent, that I didn't just decide everybody missed this question, so I'm going to grade it, darn it. They, well, if you don't show the answers to students in Canvas, which is an option, it's harder for them to do that. Mm -hmm. That's true if it's not short answer. I like I have over a hundred. They work pretty hard to help. But each of them, I'm like, you still have to study, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, if you're them. getting, it, yeah. Eventually, they don't have to work very hard if they if they're saving all that stuff for future courses. Yeah. And that's like right Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. I just I just want to I just want you to be aware of what students are doing. All right, so daily quizzes, you'll need your cards. Daily quizzes increase grades by 5%, 10%, 15%, or 20%. So this is your final grade. On the count of three, that is your final grade in the course. Over your heart, pledge your allegiance with your card. What color do you think it is? I see some blues, some pinks, some greens, some pink, I think. Green, pink, blue, blue, blue. And the answer is 5%. That may sound small, but if your average is a 65 and it gets everybody to a 70, you've come up high. 85% of students said they come to class better prepared. 74% said they came to class on time more frequently. And 71% said they participated more, 
having had a daily quiz. There was a statistically significant lower failure rate and blank percent of students reported liking daily quizzes and asking the teacher to continue with it. Please write your answer on a piece of paper. <laughs> Julie Harris, what's your number? I'm going to say 45%. All right. Oh, well, that was so wrong. Double that. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. Work with clickers or colored cards. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. With, with these studies, too, are they all courses in people's majors, or, or does it also include GE stuff? I, I think it depends which, uh, which study. I could give you the studies I've worked from, and you could look, but I can't tell you offhand. I definitely think that all this stuff increases it, but I'm, I'm wondering if like students who like quizzes, like if they were taking a GE course, they're like, this has nothing to do with my major, they maybe would report more than I think what happens is students find with daily quizzing, they find that they do better on the exam, so they're grateful to you for that, and they've seen a lot of related questions before they get to the exam. Not only seen them, but practiced them. So I think it's pretty popular. My ratio runs about like 88% for liking it. There's always somebody who doesn't like it and really trashes it on the evaluations, but there are more people who say, hey, that was great. I studied regularly. I learned a lot, blah, 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 blah. Yes? I'm just not a fan of multiple choice, and I'll tell you why. 88% of multiple choice questions test at the bottom level. You know, the Civil War was in what year? 18 blank, 18 blank plus one. I mean, that's a caricature of our questions, but um, they test at the very lowest level of that Bloom's hierarchy. And so I like to use things that make people write or speak because it, it forces us above application usually, which is into uh, critical thinking. So anything that makes people write or speak, I'm for it. Yes? I'm kind of curious, does your university where you work have like a culture of doing this, or are you one of the few people that do it? I would say I'm one of the few, but I've had a few uh, people adopt it and with good effect, if you're talking about cold calling. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had people adopt it. In many multiple classrooms, but it might be helpful. It might, but if you're the only one, you kind of stand out too. So I'm not sure. I didn't take a beating when I was the second in a department to do it. So, and I was a young woman. People were still asking me what I was majoring in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, work with clickers or colored cards. This is a formative assessment technique, much like daily quizzes are mostly formative, even though there may be some points attached. They count very little or not at all. The beauty is everyone can respond at the same time, and you can see a general, you can see a graph on the board of how they responded, so you know if it's red, green, yellow, purple in terms of answers, A, B, C, D in terms of answers. They're a little clunky still, not as clunky as they used to be. I've not used them because they're a little clunky for the technologically impaired like myself. So um, I use colored cards, which have been shown in the literature to be equally effective to clickers. I use them spot sparingly because if they're heavily relied on, people get more good at looking at other people's, it seems. Um, it's, it should be simultaneously on the count of three. I work to either have them put them over their eyes, trying to make it harder to see other people's, or over their heart. Clickers or colored cards increase grades by. Write down your number.
I think this is Karya Masai. Does that ring any bells? Nope, I can't read that one, apparently. Let's try Christy. Christy. Christy, what's your answer? Well, I, I'd say 15%. You'd say 15. You're right, 10 or 15. It's a pretty huge difference. I think it's a huger difference than quizzing because it's more constant through class. It's not just one shot or two shots if you're good and give a quiz at the beginning and the end because I do the beginning and energy doesn't go up after the quiz. If you do the beginning and end, then you've got people's attention during class too. So uh, I like beginning and end, but I don't always want to grade as many as I have to. Yes? I misheard something that you said. You said you use colored cards infrequently? Infrequently. Yeah, I use them kind of as a fun difference rather than every other minute because I'm cold calling. Okay. So I use them like I did today. Have your cards ready for each class period, but I don't use them every three seconds. So how do you handle the student says, oh, I forgot my card or I lost my card? Oh, I give them a new set if they lost them. And if they forgot them, I give them a loaner. So I carry if they'll ask me. If they don't ask me and they don't play, it's like lectures. There's a large portion of our class that's not playing when we lecture. And there's some people who are not playing when we do active learning. I have sometimes a whole group that's not playing. It's depressing, but it's true. Yes? This, this may be foolish, but like, do you have a strategy for when you use colored cards and when you don't use colored cards? Multiple choice things, I use colored cards. Um, I can't, like clickers, you can do problem solving with colored cards. I mean with, um, you can do with clickers, right. And if you do, if you make a problem solving into multiple choice, you can do it with colored cards. But uh, if it's a, an, a short answer, then I call on one person to give the short answer. Yeah. Step nine, learn to love them. This one varies at different schools, but I'll ask you anyway. The, I'll ask both questions before I have you vote. How many of you came into teaching for your love of your discipline? And how many of you, you can only vote once, came into teaching for your love of your students? If you had to say 51% one or the other. Let's see discipline. Let's see students. More students than discipline at a liberal arts school. Um, I just did this last week, way more discipline than students at a uh, research institution. So I'm lecturing to people who don't need to hear this, but I'll do it anyway. Okay. How many of you can tell me where these quotes were said and when and by whom? Modern day students are lazy disorganized, unmotivated, and full of excuses. They do not want to learn. <laughs> A long time ago, somebody said. This came from Harvard in 1920. Now, there was a tough teaching gig, Harvard in 1920. That was tough. How about this one? Children nowadays are tyrants. They contradict their parents, gobble their food, and tyrannize their teachers. <laughs> anybody, anybody? 1960s. <laughs> Have you ever looked at your class and thought these people are not like me? I have. I try to tell myself they're not, they're not less motivated, they're differently motivated. 
They're not as focused, laser focused on academics as I was, but they're very motivated with their families, with their churches, with their children, etc. I tell myself that Socrates complained about Plato, another tough teaching situation. One on one with the smartest student in the world, he still complained. Teaching is tough, that's why they're complaining. My dad was a minister at the time of his retirement. He stood up and said, people, and that includes students, are motivated by three things, fear, duty, and love, and the greatest of these is love. About that time, my mother asked him how many students he taught in his career. He got out his green, remember those green spiral notebook uh, grade books? He got out those grade books and he went through and counted each student trying to conjure their face. Taught at a small liberal arts school, Christian school. He um, couldn't conjure all of them, so he asked mother for help for certain ones. I learned a lot from his answer about how many students he taught. He taught 40 years at one college, summers and sabbaticals and free time at others. He kind of liked to teach. I read all this including, well, he had 8 to 14 classes per year with student enrollment that averaged between 12 and 39. There was another factoid. I read all this including a table, three graphs and a nine page description. I ask myself what you may be asking yourself now, what does this have to do with anything? I decided he counted his students because every student counts. Our job is to make sure students feel like they count. Active learning helps with that. Take a moment and write the step from the content section or the excuse me, the student section, that you are willing to try. Take a moment and write. like to share something they're willing to try? Yes, Nicole. I'm willing to try the gentle cold calling by using podcasts. Use the podcast mm -hmm. first and then gentle cold calling. Aha. Uh -huh. Outstanding. Thank you. Anybody else want to share something they're willing to try or a question they have about it or both? Yes. Reduce the time by lecture time. However, I'm thoroughly in general we're doing. I lectured for 90 minutes, but there is active learning in it. Yeah. Go ahead, I cut you off. No, I said you peppered your lecture with mm -hmm. questions. Thank you. Anybody else going to try something? Yes, Bob. Uh, given that a lot of my class time is uh, online, mm -hmm. is to inject the podcast responses by students that they have to post to Kansas keeping them to one minute or less so that I can hear them mm -hmm. and that they can share it with the rest of the students in their verbal response. Mm -hmm. I love those one minute posts from students because the whole class doesn't have to stop and listen to one student. They can listen to three of their peers. You have to listen to all of them, but not every day. You've got your dice, so you don't have to listen to everything they say in class. Now, one of the things that I make as a commitment, because now keeping in mind my student population ranges between 5 to 15 in a class. It's not as large as some of you, and I just have total sympathy for those larger classes. 
but in one of my upfront commitments, because I play it two ways. One is, here are my expectations of you as students, and I write them out as part of my preamble to the class. Mm -hmm. But in turn, I say, here are my commitments to you. Mm -hmm. And one of them is that I will respond to every assignment or quiz. Even if it winds up being um, an emoji with a thumbs up, I'm going to let them know that I have taken the time to view every response that I've expected them to, to write. Provide. Yeah, I do that for small classes, but I also teach 100. Yeah. And when I hit 100, I, I can't do it. Can't. I can't keep up. Because I want them to write and talk and post a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I just can't keep up with all that. Okay. So I would use lower odds in a larger class. Yes. There's a question. Someone, I was talking to a colleague over at SSU, and they use Twitter, or not Twitter, Instagram now as like a way of, so like the podcast you're talking about is like students record one minute, right? Mm -hmm. So they have the students do a picture and a response that explains how the picture is connected to the content and then hashtag it. Have you heard of that before? And, we were talking last night, you were talking to me yesterday about having students tweet. Is that right? No, was it the other guy? I'm not a tweeter. Yes. Yeah, similar idea that it goes to more people than just your classmates. It goes to all your classmates, but more. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was the one, I was the tweeter. You were the tweeter. Do you want to share anything about it, Ted? Sure, so in, in my classes, uh, master's classes, I used to have at the end of the week share a one page uh, discussion of what you learned. And I decided, well, I happen to do my PhD on Twitter, so I decided to, instead of doing that, to have them tweet 10 times, 10 things that they learned in class. So then uh, they're sharing it with their network, they're seeing the value of a social network. And I actually tried something different uh, this time around. The assignment is a true or false. Your master students, I expect you to do the work, true or false, did you do it? And uh, the second to last week in class, I said, I'm doing a spot check. If you didn't do your tweets, you'll get a zero for the whole uh, branch of that. And four students came forth and said they didn't do the tweet. But uh, that was amazing. So uh, I, I found it to be very useful. Wow. Well, it gives you an audience. All that writing across the curriculum stuff says we need an audience for when we write. And tweeting or Instagram gives us an audience, at least the class and maybe beyond the class if you have a lot of followers. OK. Um, I taught at a liberal arts school for many years, and I was determined to be buried in their graveyard. They had a graveyard for teachers which was closed. It was no longer being used. It was a formerly Christian university, and it was no longer being used. But I was determined that one way or another, I was going to finish my career there and get buried in that graveyard. I even wrote an epitaph for my grave. I wrote, a teacher to the last, here lies Tara Gray, a teacher to the last, she died trying. When you hang up your hat, what do you want your teaching gravestone to say? Equally importantly, what do you want students to say when they visit it? Take a few moments and think about that on paper quietly. <clears throat> They're coming a little bit early. They're actually on their way to oh, good. the bus. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
talk with your partner about what you've written? <coughs> Any part you want to share? to share what you want on your teaching gravestone. I won't call on you, but surely a few of you will self-identify. What? what would you like to be on your teaching gravestone, so Rick? This, what's, this is what students would write, correct? Well, the first is what you would write on your gravestone, and the second is what students would say when they came to visit. Do you want to address what I have students a second would say? question. I don't have the answer to the first one. Okay, I'll come back to you. How about the first one? What would you write on your gravestone, Bob? Here lies a true servant leader. A true servant leader. I love it. Was your hand up? No? No. Someone's hand. I saw, yes. Christy. This is just my philosophy. Love first, teach second. Love first, teach second. It is. I'm an educator. Someone asked me yesterday what advice I would give to new faculty coming out, which really caught me off guard. And I said, love your students first, and everything else will follow. But if you don't love your students, it doesn't. Yeah. So very similar to what you said. Other gravestone etchings. Did you focus more on what students would say when they visited it? Yes? Okay, who wants to share that? We'll start with Rick. Uh, I learned something I didn't know that was important and I enjoyed the class. Ah, I learned something and I enjoyed it. Great. What else? I'll share mine. All right. She loved us and we were changed by her life. Ah, oh, she loved us and we were changed by her life. That's great. Any others? I was going to say, thank God. <laughs> All right. Well, that's what I have for you today. The food will be here at 1145, I'm told. And you need to fill out evaluations and rip them off and put them in the middle of the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.